Hi, good evening. This is Talk Back. I'm Sheila, and tonight I have the real pleasure to speak with someone who's really important in our community. Um, I'm going to introduce her, and then I'll let you know what it's all about. This is Chief Lynn Malerba. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Sheila. Thank you, you for having me today. I am so glad to have you. You are the chief of the Mohegan tribe in Connecticut. Is that right? That's correct. And so, you know, when uh, people in our community in southeastern Connecticut think about Mohegan Sun, you know, they think about, oh, I dumped a lot of money there. I saw an entertainer. They really need to connect with the idea that there's a history behind all this. There's a tribe, there's American history, there's culture, right? Uh, there is their arts, there's craft, there's art that's associated with it, right? Exactly right. So you are the first woman to be the chief of the tribe, is that right? In modern times. Oh, we in modern times. We actually had a chief in the 1700s, Ann Uncas. Oh, wow. Briefly, so I in think. So modern times, and you've been the chief since 2010, right? Yes, For a while, so it's almost 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into what all your responsibilities are and, and see some interesting photos that you've brought to show us about Indian life and culture. But I want to go back and do a little bit of the history, because I think, unfortunately, too many Americans are ignorant of our history our political history, our cultural history, and certainly history about our Native Americans. You would agree to that? I would absolutely agree right. with that. I, I'm on a mission to uh, create or at least have legislation around having a native, uh, a national curriculum around American Indians and Alaska Natives, the first people well, here, as well as statewide, well, because you know, there is none. It's perfect because, you know, I started out many, many years ago as a history teacher and I taught American history, and I don't remember the books and the curricula having a lot of stuff about the uh, Native Americans. We kind of go right into the revolution, don't we? Correct, All we right. do. So give us a little bit of history. Where did the Mohegans come from? How did they get here? So this is a very interesting part of our history because, of course, we think, well, Mohegan Hill is where we all grew up, you know, right in Uncasville. Um, but we are actually the wolf clan of the Lene Lenape tribe. The who? The Lene Lenape tribe. Lene Lenape tribe, okay. Which they are known as the First Peoples, and they're from the Delaware region of our country. And so the Lene Lenape, we, there was a small group of people who decided to travel to the east because they heard of better hunting and fishing. How'd they get even to Delaware? <coughs> Where'd they come from originally? Well, most Native people believe that, you know, they, the United States is Turtle Island, and so that we come from that place. Okay. So there, there is dispute around the Bering Strait and the bridge and how people got here from Asia. But most tribes have creation stories. And so we believe that we came from that place, that the America is Turtle Island, and that it was created on the back of a turtle. Um, and so the Lene Lenape people, there was a clan, the Wolf Clan, who decided to leave and go up through upstate New York and then come down the Connecticut River. And so they came down the Connecticut River and they were known as the invaders uh, because there were other tribes that were already here. Um, and it was the Pequot Nation. And so what are we talking about? The Thousands, oh, 1100, you know, I, you know, I want to say, you know, probably before the 1600s okay, anyway. Okay. Um, and so Oneida has stories about the, uh, us traveling through their lands. We came down through the Connecticut River. In Connecticut, the river itself is Quinnetucket, which means Long Tidal River. And that's how it got its and, name. And people don't appreciate how many of our place names in Connecticut are Indian, Indian. names. Yeah. Indian yeah. names, yeah, exactly yeah. right. And so we settled on the eastern banks of the Thames River. We were known as the Pequots, the invaders, the Pequotog. Um, and around the 1600s, Chief Uncas, our Chief Uncas, had a bit of a falling out with Chief Sassicus, who was the Pequot chief. And I'm not exactly sure what, none of us are really exactly sure what happened, but it could be that there was a disagreement in terms of how to deal with the people who were coming to our shores. Should we fight them? Should we befriend them? At the end of the day, Uncas, who was Sassicus's son-in-law, decided to take his followers and go to the western banks of the Thames River to Fort Chantock, 
which is our native lands. And he took back the wolf clan name Mohix, uh, because the Lene Lenape had three clans, the turtle, the turkey, and the wolf, and we were the wolf people. And so that's how Mohegan and Pequot ended up being so two is, distinct so tribes. So who are the, is that what the Mash and Tucket Pequots were? Yes, yes. Aha. Uh -huh. So we are different. cousins. So you're related. Yes. Down through history. Yes. Very interesting. So during the American Revolution, what happened to your tribe? What was going on? So during the American Revolution, tribes had to decide who are they going to side with? Are they going to side with Britain? Are they going to side with the colonists? What's in our best interest? And in New York, the tribes actually sided with the French. Um, and so George Washington had a very big scorched earth policy in New York. We decided to side with the colonists. And so the tribes locally fought at Bunker Hill. And so we wow. had 32, I, I believe it's 32 tribal men who fought at Bunker Hill, Samuel Ashbo being one of them, and he was one of the first people to die in that battle. Wow. So at that time in the 1700s, how big was the population? How many people well, in the made up so the... In the, so they, the estimate is between the 1600s and the mid-1700s when we experienced first contact with the um, Europeans who came to our shores, we lost 90% of our people. And we lost, and again, 90% of our lands were taken When you as lost well. 90, you mean through fighting, <coughs> through murder? Through fighting, through exposure to, to diseases that we had no immunity to, mm -hmm. um, and a changing way of life. And so 90% of our lands were also taken. So are you talking about is, the Fort Shantuck area, which is if people go to Mohegan Sun, they know Fort Shantuck. Right, Fort Shantuck. Right, up, had right down Route 32 in that area. Stretching yeah. from Norwich out to Saybrook. Out to, okay. That was really our territory. And so we, we struggled, you know, as a tribe. We went from about 20,000 people pre-contact to about 2,000 people in the mid-1700s down to about you know 75 to 50 at the turn of the century in the 1900s. And so that's how tribes ended up not being able to marry within their own tribe because we were all second and third cousin. So we all have a tribal parent and a non-tribal parent because of that. Okay, interesting. So when the, when the Europeans came, mm -hmm. there was a culture, a language, a way of doing things? Absolutely. To describe it. We don't want people to think it wasn't advanced, it was somehow primitive. That, why do we have that word primitive in our minds when that's not the case? Explain that. Well, I think you, know, you, you hear the word primitive, you hear the word savage. Well, that's to dehumanize people, isn't it? Uh, because if you can dehumanize people, then you can kind of have your way with them. Well, that's so they could also convert them to Catholicism, exactly. and Protestantism. Exactly. You know. And in the 1500s, there were papal bulls from the Catholic Church saying that they would, you know, that we, the Europe was going to go to the new lands. They could conquer whoever the people were there, but they would be subhuman. You could convert them, but they would be subhuman and that they would always be subservient to the people who came to these lands. And so, you know, England, France, Spain, all kind of divided up the Americas to decide where they were going to be. Um, so it was, it was a difficult time. And you know we had a very advanced culture, all, all indigenous people do. And indigenous people are researchers. They follow what happens in the natural world and they know how to respond to that. So we were hunter-gatherers. We didn't have horses. That's not who we were. You know, Out west you see uh, the horses and the long headdresses. That's not who we were. We were hunter-gatherers. And we believed that the land belonged to everyone. That you would use what you needed, but you would always leave something behind for the next person and for the next generations and that we were stewards of the land. And we, we see that even in some of uh, Gladys Tantaquitchen's writings. She was an herbologist and she was our medicine woman and she knew the plants, the local plants very well. And so it was very prescriptive in terms of when you would harvest plants, how you would take care of the plants, what you would do with them, and what medicines you would create from them. And she learned that from the medicine women who preceded her. And so our life rapidly changed because as the Europeans came, they started fencing in our traditional hunting grounds and our traditional, our traditional gathering grounds. And, and we did plant corn and we had you know, native plants that were uh, very important to us. 
and and they would they brought livestock over we didn't really have livestock and so they started fencing everything off but they didn't fence the pigs off they let the pigs run wild they ruined the shellfish beds they ate up our plants they they roamed our traditional uh, gathering places for berries and, and and different medicines and things like that so it was a very difficult time and we didn't have a cash based economy either you know we we that wasn't that was very foreign to us. And people think of wampum as money, but it really was not money. Uh, we use wampum as tribute. So we would give wampum as tribute if we felt that somebody did something really special that was a way to honor them. Um, but it, um, we, we found quickly that you know people thought wampum was money and that really wasn't the way that worked. So our life changed and we had to learn how to assimilate. We had to learn how to adapt because the people who came to our shores thought that they were coming for religious freedom, but yet they came here and then imposed their religion on us. So it was um, it was interesting times, to say the least, but I would but, say but that- But tribe survived. But the tribe, tribe survived. survived. But uh, during that period of time, you know, also from the revolution on through the whole, what I call the whole manifest destiny, that's, mm -hmm. the, you mm -hmm. know, the U.S. just pushing its way yes. across the continent yes. to California, pushing all the tribes out of the way. How many different tribes all around the c country are we talking about? And we were, you know, you're describing your corner of Connecticut right. where you had the you know, Mohegans and then the Mashantucket Pequots. Correct. But there's a whole country in now 50 states. They all have some semblance of a Native American history, right? Yes. So, how, what, you know. so Andrew Jackson was the was the architect of the relocation movement. And, you know, U.S. policy has changed. It was assimilation, it was relocation, it was, you know, termination. And tribes were terminated in the 1950s. Um, but when you think about tribes that were relocated, there are 23 tribes in the state of Oklahoma, uh, which is amazing. And so they have about 300,000 different tribal members there now, wow. uh, which is amazing. And why were they moved to Oklahoma? Because they felt that that was land that was kind of worthless. Um, we were fortunate that we were not relocated because we built a church and we said, okay, we'll be Christianized if that's what it oh, takes so to stay building, here in our land. Building a Christian church helped Was you. very important. And some tribes said, no, we'll leave. And some tribes said, no, we're going we're gonna to stay. These are our lands. And, and our tradition says you shall always remain where your ancestors so are. So it clearly was discrimination, yes. genocide, pushing out yes. the relocation all throughout our history. And I don't think our leaders or our history has ever really atoned for that or t taken or account, it. For it in, account for it in our history and our professors and our teachers in the, in the public schools. Absolutely. Right? How many... The, uh, Indians you think were massacred or through genocide or through the relocation or disease concentration camps that were really concentrated. taking didn't they yes, take children yes, away yes. from the families to assimilate the into children the boarding into schools. the into the main world well if you think about the Cherokee and their long walk from North Carolina the hills of the blue hills of North Carolina right. the Smoky Mountains right um, they were forced to go on the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma and they lost many numerous people um, and that happened that that's a, that happened throughout the United States again we experienced it differently but you know there are stories and there are quotes from soldiers in the United States Army saying well let's give those Indians these smallpox blankets and let's hope they do their job right. and so it was genocide and we don't talk about it and for instance you know I've I developed friendships throughout Indian country I didn't know that during the gold rush there were you know 500,000 tribal citizens in California that died in the space of 30 years. You're not taught this. And so that's why I think it's really important to understand our history because we have to at least be honest about what happened uh, during that manifest right. destiny. So how many tribal members do you have now? <clears throat> so now we have about 2,300. And we experienced the same baby boom during the uh, World War II and the years after World War II that everyone else did. And we're very fortunate um, that we has, that we survived. Okay, so your mother is a tribal member. Yes. She was an el is she an elder now? And she is a, a nonner, which is okay. a res an esteemed elder of our tribe, but she was on our tribal council for 30 years, most of it as a volunteer. And your dad is French-Canadian. Non Non-tribal, and that's very common, you said, in- For us, for, yes. For us in that. Yes. So as the tribal leader, there's the government of the tribe, and I know you have a beautiful government building up Crow Hill right. Road in mm -hmm. Uncasville. 
How does that compare to the what you call the Enterprise, which is Mohegan Sun? Right. How is how what is the differentiation? Well, the Enterprise really supports our tribal government. Okay, and tribes are in the in the process of nation rebuilding, uh, because we had so many losses and we couldn't provide for our people in the way that we wanted to. And tribes, when they become re-recognized, I call it, because we always knew who we were, but we had to prove it yeah, to the federal government. Um, they. The reason to become recognized is when the United States is developing policy, they must consult with you about Native American issues and American Indian When they Indian talk about issues. you, uh, the Mashantucket Tucker Pequots at Foxwoods and you at Mohegan Sun and your area, right. having sovereignty and yes. having had to yes. go to federal court to establish that, what does that mean in practical terms? So sovereignty means that you are you are in control of your tribal government. And that's what people forget, is that tribes are not just a collection of related people, they've always been tribal governments. And so for us, it's about having a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States. And prior to the United States, we had relations with the crowns of Europe. We actually, one of our tribal chiefs went to Europe to um, sue the colony of Connecticut for the illegal dispossession of our land, and he died there. Mm -hmm. um, and we were on it. We were too poor to bring him back home, so he had to be buried outside of the city limits of London because he was a man of color. So he is buried at Southwark Cathedral, um, and we put a stone monument to him l in later years. So they performed acts that represented sovereignty yes. of, a, of an in yes. individual country, almost. Absolutely, <coughs> and so we believe that we're a tribal nation, and as nations, we can pass laws. Of about you know the conduct on our lands, about our people, and you know now that we have a business, we're able to provide services to our people, and that's so the business. And you have is your own court. You have a court. We have our own court. Attorneys have to get recognized in that court, and, absolutely, and, and follow the tribal laws. But there are federal laws, and that we you have, have our to own follow. constitution, okay. and we have our own laws and ordinances. There are federal laws that we must follow because right. when you take land into trust as a tribe, that becomes federal lands, and so you are you are required to, to follow all of federal You have to pay lands. federal taxes, right? We have to pay federal taxes, right. and we pay, as you know, a fair amount of money to the state of Connecticut in our compact. Well, because, right, there was a compact with the governor of the state of Connecticut to give 25% of the slot profits to Connecticut, is that right? Correct. Yeah, and that's, Correct. A, that's a big chunk. It's a big chunk. It is, it is. Between Foxwoods and Mohegan, we've pro we, I think the number is up to $6 billion wow. worth of slot sharing or revenue yeah. sharing. To so the just state like of the president of the U.S. is the ceremonial and governmental head of the country, uh, the one branch, you sit at the head of the tribal government, right? And you've got a council under you. Is, is that how that works? <laughs> Excuse me. No. Um, so every tribe has their own constitution and every tribe operates a, a bit differently. Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> so our tribal council is responsible for our government and for the business. They are the business board. We have a council of elders who is our Supreme Court, and they are responsible for our constitution and our culture. I work more on policy issues. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, yeah. Thank you. All right, so you work on policy. And right. you, but you're also the ceremonial yes. head, or whatever. Yes. And I know, looking at your biography, that you are involved in many projects internationally and nationally in D.C. trying to affect policies on Indian rights. Is Correct. that right? Absolutely. Exactly. And so that's part of being federally recognized. You have a seat at the table to talk about these issues with the United States government, and we're really pleased and proud to be able to do that. And what <laughs> group are you in now that you feel has the most impact legislatively or governmentally <clears throat> that will make a difference? Well, all of the tribes east of the Mississippi belong to United South and Eastern Tribes Sovereignty Protection Fund. And so we work on policy together because we believe that our voices together will create a, a stronger voice. And I also sit on a Treasury Advisory Committee a Department of Justice Advisory Committee, Indian Health Services Advisory Committee, and National Institute of Health. <coughs> Excuse me. That's okay. Dry, I guess. I know. So I know that you've given talks on, on health in the Indian community. <coughs> Excuse me. And that you're involved with a lot of the social and economic and health issues in, that are involved. The, and I'm certain that the kinds of things that face our community, whether it 
be alcoholism, domestic violence, all those things impact the Indian community the same way that they impact the rest of uh, or even in a stronger way, and sometimes. Some, sometimes even sometimes. in a stronger way. I'm noticing, we want to talk a little bit about the cultural aspects and get to some of the photos. Yes. I'm noticing the beautiful necklace that you oh, have on. Oh, thank you. Can you describe that? Well, beadwork is really important, you know, in terms of, um, thank you, in terms of our arts and crafts. And, and you will see some of the photos, you know, most people are wearing beads or they're wearing wampum for jewelry. This is a beautiful necklace that I don't know it can be replicated. I bought it at a, at a meeting, and it was a Mohawk woman who had, had made this necklace, and I'm not sure she taught anyone else how to do this. It's beautiful. Do the yeah. work here. It's just beautiful. All right, we have so much that we can talk to you about. <coughs> Before we get to the photos, what, legislatively, you said you wanted to do something about education yes, in America. Yes, what yes, yes. Just describe that. I want to see a national curriculum around the first peoples of this nation. I want everyone to learn about all of the, the, the wealth of knowledge and the breadth and, and, and difference for all of our tribes, because we're all very different. Think about the Alaska Natives versus the Natives in Seminole, Florida. We're very different. And it's a very rich history, and I think it's a part of our history that's not discussed. And then I would like to see a state-by-state -state curriculum as well. Imagine being a young girl at Mohegan School and not being taught anything about Native American people, except that once a year we would go to the Tantaquitchen Museum and, and for a visit. But, you know, we were taught that Columbus discovered America. That's not true. Right, right. right? So, so it's disappointing that even as a young girl, I wasn't taught anything about that. Mention the museum because it is up uh, uh, in, Mo in Uncasville. <coughs> What's the name of it again? It's the Tantaquitchen Museum. It is the oldest Indian owned and run museum in the United States and we're very, very proud of, of all of the artifacts that are contained within that museum, including a wampum collar from Chief Uncas from the 1600s. Wow. So he was probably the most famous representative of, he was. The, of the tribe. He was. Okay. Yeah. He is considered our great leader and when you think we live in the town of Uncasville, right. that makes a difference, right? right? So you can get there by going up Route 32 and making yes. a left turn at what? Where? Uh, onto um, Church Lane. Church Lane. That's where our tribal church is okay. as well. All right. right, great. And it's open regular Regular hours, hours, and you could go All online right. and Excellent. take a look I've at that. I've been there, and you've given a tour, and it is very important to see it. It is. So now let's take a look at some of the photos that Chief Lynn brought with her so we can <coughs> take a look. And so that's my great-grandfather, Chief Mataga. He uh -huh. was the chief from the 1930s to 50s. Wow. Let's go on. And that is Chief Mataga and Chief Tanaquidgen. Um, Chief Tanaquidgen was Mataga's nephew, and they are doing, they have wooden ceremonial medicine masks that uh -huh. they're using. Interesting. And that is Chief Mataga's parents in the front, a life filet, um, fielding. And, and behind him, uh, that's all of his siblings. And you said most current members descend, descend so from descend this family. You descend uh, from this family, yes. too. Yes, yes. Great. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Uh. Sally Tecumwes was very important to us. Uh, she donated land uh, for our church, which was held in perpetuity. She deeded it to the Mohegan people. And that church fa factored very greatly in our federal recognition because it was the last teeny piece of our reservation left. Wow. Let's go on. And there's the church. Uh -huh. And the church was always more than just a church. It was a place that we held ceremony and that we had social events at. Our Ladies Sewing Society met in the church. And I always call the Ladies Sewing Society the kind of the Mohegan underground. It was the women that kept our culture going. So you have Christian services there? Plus there are, your and they've always been Indian, open to yeah. is there uh, any, tribal uh, and non-tribal yeah. people. And is there any conflict between the Christian ceremonies and the Indian ceremonies? Well, not really. Not really. So no. you could do, you, do, you go <clears throat> to both. We you do both. You participate in both. And there's an eagle feather hanging over the pulpit to okay, remind people great. that you're in, a, you know, a right. tribal space. That yeah. was taken for the census, so that's a very posed photo. Right. Okay. Um, and that uh, okay. this is medicine woman Emma Baker. Emma Baker was a very educated woman. She ended up spending time with uh, the president of Yale's mother for a bit when she was nine. Um, and she and Gladys and Fidelia Fielding were dis you know were descended from one another, and you know they taught one another their their. Now she didn't 
have formal education, but she had. Oh no, she had she formal did. She education. Had formal education. Yeah. So she was in the me in the medicine field. Yes. Oh wow. Well, medicine. not not yeah. like a physician, right? So we're talking herbal medicine. All right. Yes. Speaker right. of Mohegan. <laughs> so is there a language then? So there is a language, and we are resurrecting it. Oh wow! It was not allowed to be speaking. People were beaten if they spoke the language, and oh. so Fidelia and her generation would not teach the next generations the language. Okay. And so we're now working with a linguist who is MIT trained. She's a Mashpee Wampanoag woman, Jessie Little Doe Baird, who has won awards for the work she's done, because we have a shared Algonquin language. And so the words that we don't have left, we only have 1,200 words left. We are feathering in. The Are Algonquin there language. Is there a written language? She too? left diaries uh, okay. behind, and they are in English and Mohegan, which is the only reason we have any words left. Unfortunately, her diaries are in at uh, C Cornell University, so we're in discussion with Cornell to, to say, to "Gee, them. could you?" So, if you get a hold of those, you can recreate the language. Yes, try and to. well, we're great. working now. Oh, right. Now, Tank. Now, is she the one who so named at the uh, museum? The Antiquitian Museum. Her uh -huh. dad and her brother built the museum. So that's Gladys at 100. She lived to be 105. She sp um, she spanned three centuries. She was born in 1899. She died in 2005. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And all of those ceremonial outfits and are handcrafted. So her her collar was only worn by three women, and so her collar is hundreds of years old. Do you wear that? I do As not. A I do not. So that is, is in that? our museum. It's in the museum. Okay. Yeah. Next photo, and that's Gladys at the museum. The reason the museum was started was to teach everyone, not only Mohegan people, but the community at large, about our history. And Gladys was famous for saying, you can't hate someone you know a lot about. Okay. And so it was a matter of preserving our history, but also sharing our history and our culture okay. with all of our neighbors. OK, great. And again, that's at the museum. Um, we would do a wigwam and a longhouse there and invite people in so that they could see what, you know, what it would be, what it would, what it would have been like to live in, in older times. So that's my great grandfather at the Royal Burial Ground in Norwich. Um, I'm sure you remember that there was a Masonic temple built on top of our burial grounds. And despite Emma Baker and her generation going to the state assembly and asking that it not be built, we didn't have the money for an attorney, and so it got built. We were able to finally take the Masonic temple down and reinter some bones that had been taken from there. Oh, wow. Interesting, yeah. And the, that's our ancient burial ground. That's Fort Shantuck. It is still an active burial ground, wow. um, and it's a very it's a place of peace. It's right yeah. on the river. It was where we would have our village as well. And that's a gathering at our wigwam festival that you would think it, you know powwow wigwam is very similar. Wigwam means welcome, wigwoman, and so we would hold a wigwam festival as a fundraiser to support our church. Aren't you having wigwam <coughs> festivals? And we still have yeah. them in August. Okay. And, and so these early wigwams were held at the church, and we, they would be under an arbor, right. and yeah. uh, and there right. would be dancing and. Lots of you yeah. know celebration and oh here you is that you that is me um, that is at the White House Tribal Nations uh, Conference uh, President Obama invited tribal leaders in once a year next to me is Rodney Butler and to his let's see to uh, the far left is Kirk Chief Francis from Penobscot next to me is Jesse Little Doe Baird from um, the Wampanoag tribe. And then we have, um, I'm going to blank on his name, but a, a, a representative of the Aquina Wampanoag tribe. Okay, great. And that was a council of Algonquin Indians. They were meeting in Rhode Island. And so that would be Narragansett, Wampanoag, Mohegan, Pequot. Okay. That's my mom and Jane Fawcett. They were, they're nonners now, but they were on tribal council for over 30 years. So nonners, N-O-N-N-E-R, means an elder. Means yeah. an elder of respect, of a respect. female elder female. of respect. Okay. And it goes back to Nanu, which is grandmother. Okay. Um, and that's a current um, wigwam festival. And that's the year that you were installed as, as chief. chief. Correct. Right. So I wear many different hats. Uh, I, my background is nursing. Um, and the photo to the left, I'm speaking at the UN on indigenous rights. And at the far right, that was when I yeah. finally graduated Yale we didn't even, with my doctoral degree. We didn't degree. even say that you had a doctorate at Yale and that yeah. you were a, a, a 
a chief nurse at uh, yes. L&M. Yeah, I worked in, uh, I was a director of cardiology and pulmonary wow. services. And, and, and those are obviously my two and wonderful daughters. in 2010, daughters. You, this became your primary <coughs> work yes. as yes. of 2010. Wow. And so that's one of the items you would see in a basket. That basket talks about Samson Occam's travels out to Wisconsin uh, because he eventually took a group of his followers and went to Wisconsin because he tired of the politics in Connecticut and he established the Brotherton tribe in Wisconsin. So that basket tells the tale. Great. And a mortar and pestle corn is a very important food for us because it's traveling food. You can grind it, bring it with you, but we also believe it's food for your soul. Okay. And that's Chief Uncas's bowl. Um, and typically those bowls would be that you don't, you don't cut them, you burn them out. And they mm -hmm. are very smooth and very soft. And you can see there's kind of wolves on either side of that. Right. That's his collar. And you can see the two white, um, the two white triangles that represents the two villages, Pequot and Mohegan. It almost looks like tiles, but I'm sure it's fabric of some kind, right? It's, uh, it's wampum inlaid with um, oh. sinew. Oh. Yeah, they would make it with sinew. And that's my great-grandfather's wolf club that was gifted to me when I became chief. Um, I don't keep it in my office because I'm too afraid to keep it there so it stays in the museum. But I can take oh. it out of the museum whenever. It looks like a if gavel. I, and when could I want a, to use it. It could be like it. a gavel almost. It could yeah. be. A stone axe, just a tool that we would have used. Uh, medicine rattle. You can see the diamond. We believe diamond means good medicine. Uh-huh. Good. And back and to now back to the, Well, this yeah. is that's fascinating. So, I mean, I've learned so much, oh, and I studied history and even taught history, and yet, what what an emptiness in our culture! Not Absolutely. really understanding, not really understanding. And I'm learning all the time when I'm yeah. out about an Indian country. I'm learning about the tribes that I didn't learn anything about either. So well, this is wonderful. It's I hope wonderful. This, uh, that your photos and your information will be distributed widely and that people will let me say good night to everyone to, for having such a wonderful guest chief lynn malurba hey look if you're at mohegan's casino get away from that slot table get away <laughs> from the uh, entertainment from the wolf lounge or wherever whatever it is and go over to the museum go over and look at uh, chief lynn's photo which is around the uh, the casino and think about the culture and the history of why you were able to, to do this and the contributions that the Native Americans in this area have made to enable you to have a good time, okay? So it's wonderful having you, Lynn. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Sheila. See it's you lovely next, to be here. See you next time on Talk Back. Good night. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.